This is Yaro Starak, and welcome to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Today's guest is Susie Daphnis. Hi there, this is Yaro. In a moment, you're going to hear my interview with Susie Daphnis, who was a really cool person to interview because I remember her on the Australian version of Dragon's Den, which you might know is a show that's a lot like the current Shark Tank show that's on TV, where small business owners and entrepreneurs pitch their ideas to a panel of dragons or sharks, established entrepreneurs who then decide whether to invest and offer support through these companies. And Susie was one of those dragons back 10 years ago. And that was around the same time as I was just starting the blog that goes with this EJ podcast. So I was very much a new entrepreneur. And I remember listening intently to all the advice the dragons gave and also hearing the pitches that the entrepreneurs did. I was very, very interested in that since I was pretty much still at the early stages of a lot of my own entrepreneurial career. So it's fantastic to have Susie on this show to hear what she did prior to getting on Dragon's Den. She had a, an $18 million exit from an events company and she's also moved on now today to essentially running an information teaching business, which is really fascinating to hear about because she's using traditional direct response and online marketing methods, all the things we do as bloggers and information marketers, things like webinars, podcasting, blogging, social media. She does all of that and she's got this fantastic uh, Australian Women's Business Network website so we hear all about that business as well it's a fantastic interview and I know you enjoy it just a quick reminder if you haven't gone to interviewsclub.com to sign up for the EJ podcast newsletter then do so now enter your name click the submit button and that means you'll get all these podcasts as soon as I release them I'll send you an email and you'll get instant notification when the fresh ones are ready you'll also get a series of my very best hand-picked interviews from my archive so you'll always have fresh content to listen to from the EJ podcast. You can get that at interviewsclub.com. But now we're going to dive into this fantastic interview with Susie. Here we go. Hello, this is Yara Stark and welcome to an Entrepreneur's Journey podcast interview. Today I have another Australian guest on the line. Her name is Susie Daphnis. Now, Susie came to my attention uh, many, many years ago from, well, I've just found out it's many, many years ago. I thought it was more recently, but through the Australian version of the Dragon's Den TV show, which you may be familiar, it's like Shark Tank, which is also on TV currently in Australia and in the States, basically where entrepreneurs come and pitch their ideas to a panel of successful entrepreneurs, of which Susie was one of them in Australia. So that's how I know Susie, but she's also done a whole lot of things and I'm a little bit surprised to learn how much blogging and podcasting and social media is a part of her background. So we're going to dive in and learn everything we can about Susie in the time we have her. So Susie, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So as I was saying to you before we started, you have a lot of different things I can list off as a claim to fame, starting obviously with Dragon's Den. You're in charge of a very large Australian women's business networking group at the moment, which has a blog, uh, 20 writers going, you've got podcasts under that, plus you've obviously had an entrepreneurial career before all this. So um, so we can dive straight in really quickly. I'd love to just take a, a trip all the way back to the beginning of this. Did you go to university in Australia or did you go straight into business? Great, great question. No, I um, uh, left home about six months before my high school certificate, so I was year, in year 12, and just family circumstances were such for that I just had to get out of home. And so I did my exams with very little study <laughs> and very little hope of getting into the university that I wanted to get into, and I, I actually wanted to do teaching. I, I didn't. I hated school, but I loved the idea of learning. And so I've carved out a career for myself in the area of training and transformational education and business education and despite it. But yeah, so I left home and then um, I needed to get a job. So I just had some very, very basic skills and started um, doing office type work. And, um, you know, after a little while, found my groove in marketing and promotion style work. And that started to take my interest. And I had a great, my very first mentor um, who's like, okay, why don't you just go to night school? I will fully support you, but you want to go to night school and get some marketing skills. Right. 
And that was kind of the best piece of advice because it put me in a niche that I absolutely loved and that has been my life's work. And, you know, in those days, marketing was about writing ad copy and writing sales letters and postcards and putting things in the mail and <laughs> and build a whole, uh, you know, a whole business using those marketing skills. Uh, and then, of course, like you said today, the way that we market is through podcasts like Your Great Podcast and through lots of social media and webinars and online training and really having very much of an online business. Okay, so that mentor, was that, um, were you in Sydney or, or Melbourne or? Great question. I was actually in Sydney. I was working for Virgin and it was just when they were starting to open up the mega stores, of which there are none now, right? right. Because we all download our music. But it was um, the very first mega store in Darling Harbour and I had started, I got my foot in the door uh, by applying to be a receptionist because I really wanted to work for this organisation. I'd travelled to the UK like a lot of young Aussies do and I came across Virgin there and I thought this is a brand that I really love and I loved Richard Branson's story and I wanted to work here so when I saw an ad for a receptionist I thought okay well I don't it's not too hard I can do that took but still they interviewed me three times wow. <laughs> to get my job as a reception and within six months the ma marketing manager has snapped me away and took me under his wing and um, he was a young English guy by the name of Mike and um, he's the one that sort of encouraged me he's like you know you can you can do this and you can really carve out a career for yourself if you just apply yourself to it. And so he, I worked with him for about three years and then he got promoted to go and run Virgin in um, Japan. And I uh, moved on and worked further in the music industry and then, you know, got to my mid-20s and thought, oh, I really don't know what I want to do with my life. And um, I left the music industry and went travelling again. And, and while I was away, a friend that I'd met through one of the record companies uh, did a personal development course that changed his life. So when I came back and I was broke and 25 or 26, I don't know how old I was, um, I went, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I feel like I've got no skills. And he's like, why don't you do this personal development course? It, you know, it'd be really great. And, and what, I had no was, it? was that Landmark or Tony Robbins? Or? Actually, yeah, very close. It was round around that Tony Robbins time. It was a course called Money and You. Okay. And uh, hasn't, it hasn't run here for a long, long time. But it was a three-day course and I think it was $750. And that was $750 more than I had. Mm. Um, and so I managed to save it up and I was sitting in my broken down, um, almost broken down green Toyota uh, in the parking lot outside of where the seminar was. And I was with a girlfriend and we looked at each other and went, we could go to Melbourne for the weekend It'd be great. We'd spend all this money, stay in great hotels. But I'd committed to my friend that I was going to do this course because he's like, okay, you need to get back on track. And so I went in, handed over my money and the rest kind of is history. It was through that program and through that community that it reignited my absolute love for learning and education and not traditional education. And I went on to work for the company that promoted that course and then to start my own events business um, out of my spare room, you know, with absolutely no money and just a little bit of, you know, some marketing skills. Mm -hmm. And that grew that into an $18 million business, which I sold um, in 2007 now. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'd love to dive into how to grow an $18 million events business. Um, but obviously, <laughs> I, I want to talk about the, the online stuff. Could you give us like the Cliff's Notes, the highlights reel of, um, you know, what was the big takeaway in terms of getting to that size of company? Considering it was also physical, right? We're not talking digital. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We would ship books, tapes, CDs and run physical events around the country. And it was one of those things where, you know, we were young and energetic and just put heart and soul into it. But we accessed mentors. You know, we really relied on the, the generosity of people who had walked the path of entrepreneurship before us and who would allow us to, to ask questions and participate. We did lots of courses ourselves, you know, and we would need to learn something. We would find a master. We, went, we bought one of the very first ever internet marketers um, to Australia in 1998 who was who, talking who was about that? internet marketing. His name was Corey Rudel. Oh, yeah. I remember Corey. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and so I was very interested in the idea because I schlepped a suitcase around for many, many years <laughs> doing live events when this thing called the internet came about, I went, I want in, I want to understand that and I really want to get it. And so, um, but that business that we built and we built offices in the US and uh, there was a publishing arm. So we would, you know, create a brand out of a speaker and then publish their books and tapes and CDs in those days. Um, but the key was just, again, just a real commitment to having the right people around us, really great mentors, really great peers, you know, 
soaking ourselves in all the education we could get, which in those days, you know, was books and physical things. Again, the internet wasn't what it was today. But as soon as I got a whiff of what the internet could be and I started learning that, I knew that I wanted to create an online business. So when uh, we sold um, uh, Power Hour Events, which was our business, um, I had been involved with the Australian Business Women's Network, which I'm working with now, which is also an on, it's a training organisation for women entrepreneurs more than it is a networking group. But again, we used to run, you know, monthly events with canapes and guest speakers and that got really tiring. Plus, we couldn't really be the Australian's Business Women's Network because we weren't getting to most of the people who live in regional and rural Victoria who aren't available at 7pm on a Thursday night the first week of the month. So, it allowed us to expand, to bring in what technology was available and we We've always been very early adopters of technology and whether it's, you know, email marketing, you know, from the late 90s or being, you know, very early on in Australia and having a website to, you know, being the first female podcaster in Australia or, you know, having a, having a great blog. And, and one of the things that we teach a lot f to our community is to really harness what technology can offer because otherwise you're leaving a lot of money on the table and you're working way too hard. Mm. So am I correct in assuming, given you knew Corey Rudel, that – you studied a lot of direct response marketing, like maybe Jay Abraham and Dan Kennedy during the early days as well? Just last night in my garage, I still my folder of all my Dan Kennedy uh, books, you know, which were these spiral bound tombs, <laughs> you know, that you used to get. And Jay Abraham, of course, when he was here as well. So I did study a lot of direct response and I was just the other day saying, so we would do a newsletter and so at the time I think we had 30,000 clients. This is one memory I have. And we would mail 30,000 newsletters on a bi-monthly basis. And when we had an event coming up, we would do a three or four part mailing sequence. That's really expensive. Mm. Now, wow. it worked. And it worked. Too, like... But right now I'd be going... I don't want to pay any of that money. I'm just going to click send. Mm. <laughs> wow. You, so you really, you are an early adopter for everything that came before internet marketing as well, as well as internet marketing itself. That's, uh, especially in Australia, because I have to say, Australia is a bit late to the game for some things with, with online and, and direct response. So you must have been a bright spark in, in a, <laughs> doing things that other people would like, what are you doing? Sending 30,000 four-part emails to, to get customers? That's why aren't you doing TV ads shake. and radio? Yeah, it makes, me, it's making me shake thinking about it. But, you know, I've always, you know, sent myself overseas to study and, you know, and put the money on the table to learn. So if that information was coming from the US, then that's where I was going. And even today, every year I go to Austin in March to attend the South by Southwest conference because that's where a lot of new media and marketing comes out of. It's where Twitter was launched. It's where Foursquare was launched it's where you'll see Al Gore speak about climate next to seeing you know the author of your favorite business book next to seeing someone talking about robotics or you know it's I'm a avid learner and I really believe that um, there is so much information available to us um, but you know learning it is one thing but then if you're sitting in a vacuum and you're not implementing it then that's a whole other thing so um, yeah, thank you for the acknowledgement and I really appreciate it. But everything that I have achieved and my team has achieved has come out of taking knowledge and putting it into action. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, after your events company, was the Dragon's Den around that time or...? Yeah, it was. I was actually living in the US. I'd been featured in the BRW Young Rich list three or four times at this stage. And I got a call from the producers at, um, and it was Channel 7 at the time. And, you know, it was like an out of the blue call. And I'm like, I don't know why you would want me. I'm just a small business owner. And they're like, look, just come in and meet with us. And I went to this studio. I think it was down at the Rocks. Well, it was just a meeting room. And um, there was two guys and they were just asking me questions. Uh, and I I said, look, I'm not an actor. I don't know how to do TV. They're like, no, all you have to do is be yourself. Do you know the Dragon's Den? And I had seen the American show. And I was terrified, Yarrow. I was like, what? I'm going to go, what if I sound really stupid? What if I don't know what to say? And, and it was terrifying. And they're like, well, just do a quick um, screen test. I said, no screen test. We said we were just going to talk. You're just going to ask me questions. That's it. Anyway, they managed to convince me, look, they just had this handy cam, happened to have it on hand, you know. <laughs> and they're like, you know, just keep talking to, you know, Michael was the producer's name, just keep talking to Michael, I'm just going to take, you know, just. Anyway, I went home and thought, well, that's very nice. Now that they've met me they, and they know how terrified I am, nothing's going to come out of it. And then within two days, I got a phone call. Then I was really scared. Because. <laughs>
because I was still living in the US and I came back to film the show and actually when it went to air in Australia, which was the end of um, 95, I was still in the States and someone sent me a CD and we had a big launch party in my backyard in Arizona. <laughs> um, but what was awesome about that experience, um, you know, as much as it's obviously a great acknowledgement of, you know, my achievements as a business person, what it was for me is the ability to give back to small businesses, not only the ones who came on the show, who, and we saw hundreds of pictures, you know, and only a few made them onto the screen in the end, but also to everyone who was watching at home who could take away a tip or an idea, who knew how important it was that when you pitch your business, you've got to understand the numbers. You have to have a business plan. Mm. You can't do this on your own. And again, for me, it all ties back into that inspiration and education that's very much a part of my values and what I think can really make a difference for anyone who takes that entrepreneurial journey, has the guts to do that, is like don't let yourself down by not surrounding yourself with the right information and the right people and, the right, and taking the next step. Now, you're also a big advocate for uh, female entrepreneurs. So I assume getting on the Dragon's Den you know, to represent the female entrepreneurs mm. on that show would have been uh, an important to you as well is that it was great and yeah. I was also at the time the, you know the youngest dragon on the panel as well and so for me definitely representing women and the great thing is you know Australia has uh, you know as many if not more female entrepreneurs as men but you don't always see them so I'm sure Yarrow you go to business conferences and you know you struggle to see a woman in the lineup they're mm. in the audience but they're not there or you know there's podcasts like this and there's never any female guests and, and it doesn't make any sense to me so I'm really passionate about never tokenistic representation but just real representation. We're out there, we're doing business. We have a Business Women's Hall of Fame where every year we induct women into for their achievements in entrepreneurship and we never have any trouble finding women. So, um, yeah, so I, we're on about it. But, you know, the education we provide, like we, had, we did a webinar this morning, you know, a third of the people are guys. And that's just because we're offering solid business education and it's not about being a woman in business as such. Well, you'd be happy to know that you are now the seventh Australian woman I've interviewed on the podcast in a row. Because, in a row. Because narrowly my assistant subconsciously, I think I've just gone looking out for Australian <laughs> female entrepreneurs. <laughs> well, if you need any more, I, I have lots of them. <laughs> I have great colleagues. I'll, I'll, I'll pass narrowly on to you for that one. But I'd love to talk um, more about how blogging and, and the podcasting fit into all of this for you. So can we maybe go back to the start of that? Because, uh, you know, you, you had left the events company by then when you'd switched to online. Yeah. Yeah, so I sold, uh, my partner and I sold Power Hour Vents and I was in a position where I, you know, could start another business or I didn't have to do anything really because um, I'd always, you know, invested and was taken care of on that side of things. And so I decided what I wanted to do and what I loved was what the Australian Business Women's Network represented, but I didn't want to schlep around the country with a suitcase. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to take what I know about the internet and I'm going to go and I'm going to learn more and um, and learn how do I do events online and have them be effective. So we committed to just sort of cutting it off and just going, that's it. No more live events. Let's figure this out. How do we create a sustainable business without doing that? And it wasn't called content marketing then. And I don't even know that it was, I, I don't even know if it was called blogging, but <laughs> one of the, one of the things that we decided to do, I did go to a conference and they were talking about this thing called blogging. And I understood that it was just like having a website with lots of articles on it, which we'd always had articles on our website. It just wasn't called a blog. And um, and I got this idea. I thought, well, if it's up to me to publish posts a number of times a week or a month, it's not going to happen because I just know myself. I know my commitments. I thought, but what if I give the opportunity to other business women who are part of my community to share their authority and expertise by ha being part of a blogging team? And so now for, I think, five, uh, no, 19, uh, no, uh, I'm trying to remember what year. 2008, we started the blog. Mm -hmm. And we've all, it's always been the contributors are women who are in our network who are experts. And they're experts in things I know nothing about. So, you know, it could be HR or it could be finances or it could be, you know, I still blog about, you know, confidence and personal development and marketing. But I have all these other people whose uh, profiles are built, but they make the blog as rich as it is. And a couple of years ago, um, we were a finalist twice, actually, in the Australian blog awards and then last year uh was it last year we won our category which is the business category which is pretty 
you know, it's a pretty serious category. There's some serious players. Um, and we were also invited to be on the stage at Pro Blogger, which is, of course, the preeminent event for bloggers in Australia. And what I love about blogging, and I think, it, you know, it might be a little harder than writing a tweet or doing a Facebook post, but it's such a great way to establish authority and make the search engines love you if taking traffic to your site is important. And it's really easy these days within a blog post to create, and I'm going to talk a little, t you know, techie language or marketing language, but for creating a lead magnet, you know, something that your uh, readers will exchange for their name and email address to help you use that blog to build your database, which is ultimately where... Tell me if I'm talking too much marketing, Yarrow. <laughs> no, keep going, you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, because ultimately, whether you have a website, whether you have a Facebook page, the key is to get people onto your database where you can communicate to them on a personal basis and really nurture them towards your products and services, whatever it is that you have available. But the blog remains kind of the, the backbone of our website and we publish probably four or five times a week and as I said, we have um, bloggers and they commit on a rotating cycle. It's all very systemized so that they know when their posts are due and then when their post is done, you know, we create a visual post and then we spread it out through social media so their profile's growing, their businesses are growing and they're also adding lots of value to the blog. Okay, so for those listening in, it's abn.org.au, so you can see uh, what we're talking about so far, and you can see all the blog posts, and you actually still maintain a column. I can see that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I yeah, I have to keep my um, myself in the game, <laughs> and you know, I, I have things to say. I just couldn't post three times a week. It's no. not. It's no interest to me. Yeah. Well, you're speaking my language with lead magnets and uh, you know, building a database, getting your opt-in list going, and obviously you're doing automated sequences. I'd love to know, since it's pretty clear to me now that the Australian Business Women's Network is your your main focus at the moment. What's the business model now? Is it selling online courses, or how does it like? run as a business? Yeah, great question. We've tried a couple of different things. Um, we uh, went down the line for a while of uh, being a publisher, so having sponsored ads and sponsored posts and uh, generating advertising from our traffic. And that's a good strategy and we have a pretty healthy, even though it's a very niche site, it's pretty healthy traffic for a niche site, but it's a very difficult way to make money and I, ultimately I feel it's a distraction from selling your own products and services. So we're just in a transition phase right now where we will still send a sponsored EDM out to Google because they want to offer AdWords or to Officeworks because they have an end of financial year sale. So we'll still do that sort of um, partner offers to our database and we'll still have some website advertising but ultimately we want to sell our mentoring. So we've been doing mentoring since 1998 and it used to be face-to-face -face in a room, mentor, mentoree. A few years back we developed the first national online mentoring program and the Australian government actually underwrote that whole writing of that program. Um, and, so, and, and the model of mentoring has changed but we do have mentoring services. So we will match you with someone who's been in business for a longer time, who has the skills to that sort of complement where the gaps are in your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there's a few streams. There's advertising, sponsorship, uh, mentoring, and then training. And and a lot of that training is in that area of small business. It has a little bit of a marketing bent because we keep finding that that's the area that um, businesses need help with. And But, you know, we teach people how to start a podcast, you know, how to do webinars. You know, we're doing a course right now called Content Sells, which is about, you know, how to use different types of content marketing to generate an income. So, yeah, so that that's some of them. Um, and, you know, corporate dollars are great and we do have a very niche audience. Um, but there's also value, I think, in, you know, having our solid mentoring and training mm. programs. It's a similar... Uh, progression to what I've gone through with my blog, moving away from advertising and Have affiliate you? marketing. Oh, yeah, I've been right. blogging for 10 years, so I've, I've started, like most bloggers, doing the same thing, and now it's very much uh, what I call a, a blog sales funnel, so you know, a range of products and services, front-end products, back-end courses, and so on. Do you have a, a, a sort of robust automated email, or is it more like just broadcasting newsletter type strategy with your yeah, email? Great, great, thank you. And... Um, Oh, I love this. We could just talk about this for <laughs> all day. Um, so for the longest time, we had a very much a broadcast strategy. And what I mean by that, um, for those listening, is we'd have a webinar coming up. We would send out an email to the whole database and hope that some people came along. And they have. And, we, you know, we do get hundreds of people. And we've been running webinars since 2007. We're, you know, probably, yeah, we do it a lot. 
so we did that for a long time and it's only been in the last couple of years and since um, having a robust system that we use in order to help us manage the database and the email communications in a more thoughtful way that we've developed a couple of um, automated marketing funnels for our two big products, membership and mentoring. And so we've built um, really robust systems that, you know, what it's like, you know, you put something out there and then you can tweak. So if you come into our community, We'll welcome you. You'll get a sequence of emails that tells you who we are and what we do and what we can offer you. But if you expressly express interest in mentoring or our membership, then you will go down a channel of communication from us that is specifically about those things. And it's the smartest decision we made because the broadcast system, while it worked when we had special offers and things, ultimately it was not giving us the return because we were talking to people about things that they hadn't raised their hand to say they were interested in. Yeah. Our newsletter still goes to everyone. And that it's a newsletter, you know, it's very broad. It has, you know, and we have another one called What's On, which is all the events coming up. But otherwise, we try and have it be very much based on what you express interest in. And what you express interest in may be the ebook you download or the webinar you attend, the free webinar you attend, or the white paper, or, you know, or you responded to a podcast in which we've, you know, said, you know, download or contact us. You know, whatever it is that you're responding to. We right. try and be more thoughtful. It takes a lot more energy, as you know. You yeah, know, right? behavioral segmentation is really, yeah. To build it, but ultimately I think that's really the way we have to go. Otherwise, you know, if people are uh, – I was interviewing – an author named Ryan Dice last week and we were talking about um, he's very much on email sequences and he was saying, you know, if you're emailing your clients and they're not opening or they're not clicking, to them you're pretty much a spammer. So stop doing it. And I just almost choked. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> they're on my database. Of course I'm going to email them. Um, and he said, yeah, but, you know, there's a point where you have to either re-engage them or stop it because they're going to they're going to blacklist you. <laughs> um, and I thought that was interesting because every name on our database is so precious to mm. us because we're a marketing organization. Um, but he had some, yeah, really good points around that. Okay, so you've obviously got some pretty good segmentation starting to be built up with this business. Do you mind if I ask in a technical standpoint, what, what's your platform based on at the moment? Are you like Infusionsoft or? Yeah, exactly. We're Infusionsoft. We're three years in to Infusionsoft and, um, you know, it's a monster of a thing and a monster in a good way, but it's it's not easy necessarily uh, but we again we've gotten lots of coaching and training and we continue to develop how we use it so when we first started to use it we were pretty much using it just as a database and a broadcast email thing but it's really um, very clever and it allows us to be really thoughtful in the way we respond to people uh, whether it's through transactional emails thank you for your order and then a straight up so uh, you know uh, but it's a way of thinking. I think something like Infusionsoft, if you get into the education of it, teaches you a way of thinking about, you know, taking people through a series of nurturing them towards a sale uh, and moving away from – now, the tool's not going to teach you to do that. You know, it's our study of a different way of doing it. So, yeah, we use Infusionsoft as our CRM. We use um, – that with some other tools, like we use lead pages to create our landing pages because we have got such a busy website and thank you for giving that URL out earlier. But it's such a busy website. There's so many choices that a person could make that when we want to talk to you, you know, just about our mentoring, then we're probably going to send you to a page that just gives you the option to learn about mentoring and there's no navigation and there's no other distractions. And our website is WordPress and I'm embarrassed to say it's not a responsive site. We're in the process of building something that will be released later in the year. But we moved from um, a website that we had spent tens of thousands of dollars on, if not six figures. And it was a great shopping cart. And it was what we used in my old business when we were selling, you know, thousands of tickets to events. But it wasn't didn't understand, you know, it, it didn't understand like it's a thing, but it, it didn't understand SEO and it wasn't built for blogs and it didn't have any of that intelligence. So it was really dumb as far as modern marketing, but it had cost us so much money that we held onto it for the longest time, you know, and the best thing we did was move to WordPress and move to Infusionsoft. But at the time we had just run budget. And so creating a responsive site at the time was like, oh, that's too hard. We'll do that later. But the time is definitely, has definitely come. So we're just trying to do the best with what we've got at the moment. Now, you keep saying we. So who's involved with this? There's obviously 20 bloggers, other bloggers you said. Yeah, uh, so who else is on your team and what do they do? We're, 
Yeah, thank you. We have a team of seven people. Um, we have uh, someone who's like web and design. We have a uh, customer service person, operations slash campaign manager. We have an uh, event coordinator and executive assistant. We have um, me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we'll call me. Admin girl. No, just kidding. <laughs> and I've, I'm missing someone. Oh, and we have a marketing coordinator who's based out of the Philippines. Um, and then we have our bloggers and we have an advisory board who I meet with once a month who kind of keeps me in line and, you know, focused on the big picture. And then we have our mentors. So, that's they're part of our team. But our core team is six it's about to be seven people, which is not a big team. We we actually output a lot of content uh, for such a small team. What what is the? I know you said you're the the admin person, but what is really the day in the life of Susie <laughs> to do with this business? Um, one of my favorite things to do is podcasting. And so I do, I host our two podcasts. One's called Her Business and it's interviews with inspiring women and the other one is called Social Media for Small Business. So I'm the host for those. And I generally start off our webinars if I'm not delivering the content myself, which I try not to. Um, uh, it, so I'm usually the host. I'm sort of head of marketing and definitely comms person. So any PR that we do, I manage that and, you know, I'll jump in and do whatever, you know. <laughs> but, but, but marketing is really my area and my passion and strategy. It must be a, a different role to what you had when you're running the events company. Yeah, I was COO in that um, uh, part of the time but always head of marketing. But, you know, I had a big marketing team because we – well, because we had the capacity and we had the need for it. Mm. Plus, because I had an office in the US, I had a team in the US and then I had a team here. And so, I was just trying to be across, you know, the higher level things, but always in the area of marketing. But also, I'm also really good, um, you know, with setting up systems and then letting people run with them. So, I'll go in go in there. What I'm, I'm not good at is the HR day-to-day -day sort of admin stuff. And... Um, and I'm really good at looking at financial reports, but I, I don't get involved with the the doing of them. I was going to ask, you exited from your previous company and you obviously had the world of your options at that point. Was it a deliberate decision to move on to something that is obviously less, uh, I don't want to say stressful, but it's not as hands-on with the amount of people you've got working under you, the amount of moving parts, the physicality of an events company, but yet you still chose to do something else. You're not on a perpetual holiday since you exited. <laughs> as a lot of people dream about, oh, once I exit, I'm going to do nothing for the rest of my life. But that's rarely what actually happens. So was, was that deliberate to sort of keep going down this path of marketing online? It was uh, because it just – it was like, well, if I start another business – and I was never going to do nothing because, you know, I was – in my 30s still and I was like okay well what am I going to do you know <laughs> go and play golf I don't like golf or do anything on my own or my friends are working and and I'm very passionate about education and really making a contribution and so I thought okay well what if I was to take this organization take it online and yeah dial it down a bit so I'm not on the road all the time I you know I I bought and renovated a warehouse in Sydney and moved in and just had a little more of a lifestyle and so you know when we had our businesses. It was awesome. We were making a lot of money. We were seeing a lot of cities. We were helping a lot of people. But we were also burning out. It was just go, go, go for 13 years. And so then when I had an opportunity to do it, some, to do it differently and I had built this business with my, with my partner and uh, one of the things we did when we started to earn money is we started to invest in real estate. So when we sold our business, he's like, I'm just going to do real estate. That's what I really want to do. And I went, great. I said, what I really want to do is I don't really want to start another business because I'm just going to start the same business I just had. <laughs> so why don't I, you know, because this is what I love. I love education. I love technology. I love media. And so I just went down this path and it was I had to evolve. I had to settle back into being in one city, not having a huge team, you know, and it took a little while. But I've really found my groove and, you know, marketing has changed so much. I've had to re-educate myself. So the last three or four years – even more actually, marketing has just changed so much and that I felt like I had to go back and start from scratch again. You know, even learning to podcast and how to put a podcast together and, you know, honing my interview skills or doing webinars and building curriculum for online, which is very different. Compliance is different. The way you market it is different. Um, 
So always being in that learner's seat and going, okay, well, what's next? But doing it, as you said, at a different pace where I'm not racing around. Mm. You know, I have time to think. And, and that's really something I really treasure. So what is next? What's the vision for this? Since I can tell you, you've got a vision for it, but you don't want to become this huge monster that's out of control. It's, it's kind of like a, a lifestyle business, a passion business, but you want to see it become something. What is that something? Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the last couple of years, I've started to really um, connect with the impact that we can have not only nationally, but internationally through what we offer. And so, right now, I'm bedding down our systems. I'm increasing our capacity by hiring a few more staff. It's not going to be as big. I don't think it's what it was. Um, and just through building more automated funnels to see, you know, what, what products and services does this audience really know? I'm putting more time into getting really granular around who our ideal customer is and what their pain points are. And so, I'm kind of going introspective and, re you know, a little more rather than flying by the seat of our pants onto the next thing, spending more time on formulating our thinking. So I think scale. I, I feel like I'm ready to put the accelerator on again and I'm a little bit afraid, you know, that I might grow this thing that's really, really big, but I'm, hopefully I'm a bit smarter <laughs> <laughs> now and we'll grow it at a, at a rate that is like, okay, we're all winning, we're learning, we're going good. So, so for me, there's still a lot more there to do. I'm really proud of what we've achieved in the end, we're still a small business. You know, we're, we're a team of six people. We still have the constraints that small businesses have, but we also have the agility that we can, you know, the business 12 months ago looks different to what it did the 12 months before, all by design, all by going, okay, now we can take this direction. And I don't know if I'm answering your question very well, but for me, it's about scale now. It's like I feel ready. And really after having been in business, I really was for 13 years, um, I really was quite burnt out. And like you've picked up, I really didn't want, anything that was going to be a real headache that was going to be, you know, I wanted to be able to focus on what I was eating and my CrossFit and my, you know, just mm -hmm. my education and, and just doing that more balance. lifestyle, that more balance. And But I feel like I'm, uh, I'm ready to press the accelerator again. Got to can't, can't keep the ambition down, can you? It's when it's no. there, it's there. <laughs> uh, just right. in maybe in the last sort of five minutes uh, with us, Susie, I'd love to just turn our attention to the listener here, uh, since you have such an incredible wealth of, of knowledge and skill and, and uh, experience of growing two types of businesses, I, I could say an offline business and an online business, although the lines yeah. are certainly blurred. Someone listening into this, especially since you, know, you're, you, you have such a wealth of knowledge with helping other uh, women entrepreneurs, of which I have a few are listening as well. If and this advice obviously applies to men as well. But you know, if you're sitting there listening to this and you're going, "Well, Susie seems to have this magical touch and confidence where she can just you know build an audience, hire people, manage a team, do all this really well." If we're going right back to the start, what would you have someone who maybe doesn't feel that sense of confidence? Maybe you can even reflect back on your. 21 year old self who went for the receptionist job um, at that time and then when you first got that spark to do your own thing you know what what would you advise them to do today especially given the current climate which you have to say is somewhat more competitive somewhat more complex online so many options but so many people do many doing so many different things where would you suggest they start mm. Confidence is something that I'm so glad you mentioned because it's something that um, I've been looking at for a number of years now because, uh, gosh, again, I'll try and be succinct, because if you look at actually the study of confidence, um, which we've been doing over the last 18 months, it is, it is a habit that's developed. And when we interviewed, and we've interviewed 160 women now who have been in our Hall of Fame, about what it was that kept them staying successful and breaking through when they faced challenges, it was this ability to stay confident. And as we drilled down, uh, we started to find something that we thought which was pretty huge. And that was that the idea of confidence is actually scientific, scientifically linked to better business performance. So we found evidence that said that um, the more confident someone feels, the more likely they are to take action, the more competence they build, and it builds this kind of cycle. 
as I develop the confidence habit. So I'm in a bit of a mission at the moment. And so your timing is really perfect to really distinguish confidence, not from, you know, what I'm wearing, having the right handshake, but really being about what is it that I do on a day-to-day basis in my business that helps me build confidence. And so when we interviewed these women in the Hall of Fame, there were a number of things that came to the surface. And those are some of the things that I mentioned earlier. And they're the types of things that gets us through analysis paralysis. It keeps us really focused and it helps when we're struggling um, to get a clear direction of what we want to do. And so those things have been for me. And again, as I said, it's a subject we've been studying and we've even created an ebook about it. It's, it's about um, what are the things that really build confidence. And what I would recommend to those listening is to consider these few things. Um, the first is connecting with a purpose greater than yourself. And I know, Yara, you don't do the work you do if you weren't connected to something greater than yourself. Okay, I, I know we, we don't really know each other, but I get that what you're doing is not for a quick buck. <laughs> <laughs> he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> so what we found is that the women in our Hall of Fame had a very clear and very big purpose that went beyond their personal success. So whether it was the woman who di- discovered the Keep Cup, which are the ceramic cups, whose you know goal is to eliminate the waste of cups, or whether it was... Um, you know, the woman who created a biodynamic uh, dairy products because they're better on the environment. Um, They had a purpose that was bigger than themselves. Or, you know, the woman who developed the sleeping bags for the homeless. It wasn't about making a buck out of sleeping bags for the homeless. It was about the impact that they could make. The second thing was... um, tapping into your passion and being prepared to take risks even when others are saying no. So it's not good enough to just have passion, but it's about taking that action. And one of the women um, was talking about how taking risks is something entrepreneurs do every single day, but it's that when you're not taking risks, you're almost going backward. And I know when you're small in business and you don't have a lot of money and you you have a lot on the line, taking a risk seems like a super big deal. And it is. I took a risk when I hired my first employee. I took a risk when I hired my 30th employee. I took a risk when I moved to the US and left my business in someone else's hands. And so some of those risks are bigger than others. And I think as we get more confident and we do some of these things, then we're willing to take bigger risks. The other thing is surrounding yourself with people, and I mentioned this a little earlier, you know, I've had an advisory board in my business since I was a business of one person, and that is having awesome people around me and peers who will not only give me a pat on the shoulder, but also smack around the head, you know, when I'm really off track, and who can, um, who understand the journey of the entrepreneur, and they can be a sounding board for my ideas. And I really encourage you to find your own mastermind or find your mentor or find the people around you who are your tribe and who understand the journey you're going on. And there's an African saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I really believe in that. I really believe that by teaming up with the right people, you know, whether they're other entrepreneurs, online marketers, you know, my tribes are geeky online marketers. (laughs) They're part of my tribe. (laughs) Women in business, women entrepreneurs, um, crossfitters, you know, when it comes to another side of my life. But, you know, finding the people that share your vision for what you want to create in an aspect of your life. The other thing, should I keep going? I've got two more. (laughs) Keep on going. (laughs) Okay, great. So the other thing, because I don't don't want to forget these two, one of them is really about being prepared. And to be in business, the best way to prepare is to consistently be in the learner's seat and to access regular education. Now, you're listening to this podcast. I hope we're giving you some value. But, you know, this marketing, sales training, management training, finance training, personal development, and I'm just going to take a little break out and say finances. One of the things that really bothers me, see, I'm not a numbers person. I'm far more a marketer. But in order to get successful in business, I had to face those darn numbers and know that I could have all the passion and be having all the fun time. But if the numbers were going down the toilet, then it wasn't worth it. It wasn't my uh, return on investment for my time and energy was not right. So really big believer in education. And there's so much you can get online. You know, you're listening to this podcast. It's free. We do free webinars. Lots of people do. But it's also about putting your money on the line, being like me in that car park and handing over the 750 bucks because it's something that's going to be really important and change your education. We mentioned a gentleman named Corey Rudel. He was a master of internet 
about marketing. I flew to Vancouver to see him, you know, spending dollars that, you know, I, I didn't really have, but I knew that if I could just take that information and bring it back into my business, none of my competitors were doing that. None of my competitors had a clue. So I could be first out the gate. And then finally, it's taking action. And we talked earlier about taking action. And we know that confidence and action are really intrinsically related. And I don't know if you relate to this, Yaro, but you know, when you try something and you get a little win, it gives you the confidence to take the next step. And I've certainly found that true for me. So, and sometimes taking action will lead to something failing. And that's okay because you learn by trying stuff. And sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not. But, you know, that taking action, that surrounding yourself with the right people, all those things for me are things that you can do right now, you know, without spending a cent to really break through in your business. Ah. It's a good, uh, good ending note. I think, <laughs> Susie, that was a fantastic rant. Um, so many points. I think there was five or six or seven points there to, to note down. Uh, I wasn't expecting that much. Um, okay. So, wow. Uh, good, uh, I'm, I'm glad we got to cover so much of what you're currently doing. And thank you for also diving into a little bit of the background. I, I, I'd love to also spend just as much time talking about the events company because I'm sure you had an incredible amount of lessons and growth there to share as well. But time restricts us. So um, just last few uh, seconds here, obviously your website abn.org.au to check out um, everything that's going on with the Australian Business Women's Network and a lot of what we talked about. So you can see um, your podcast, your blog post, your mentoring, your membership site, everything that um, Susie is currently doing and uh, is growing. Um, Is there anywhere else we should sort of know about with regards to what you're doing now or maybe your podcast I, I haven't seen that listed yeah um our podcast you'll find it in itunes it's called her business is one of them and the other one is called social media for small business um yeah if you pop up to our website and you there's a little orange button at the top of the screen if you want to join our community there's free membership there and we'll send you details of all the different things we have on offer um but if not yeah just check us out in itunes and yeah i look i really appreciate Um, the opportunity to talk to your listeners and and hopefully add a little bit of value. Well, thank you for for sharing uh, all the details. Uh, I'll put the show notes in with the podcast so you guys can get all the links that Susie's been talking about in the interview. Um, That's pretty much it, Susie. Thank you for for joining me today. I really appreciate your time and I know uh, you're going to do great things. I have a feeling that ambition might be hard to keep a lid on so um, <laughs> well I thank you I thank you for what you're doing and uh, really anyone who's in the um, in the game of sharing knowledge and education is someone that I fully endorse and I thank you for the opportunity to be on the show uh, and I really enjoyed the little trip down memory lane I had no idea you've been in the game in the same game as I've been for so long so that that was great to hear but I, I can think about myself I think I would have been 25 listening to or watching you on Dragon's Den and the other dragons um, I wouldn't think 10 years later we'd be on a podcast together so that's kind of cool as well it's very cool <laughs> thank you again I really appreciate it And thank you, everyone, for listening in. This has been the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. If you do want to get the show notes and the transcript to go along with this interview, just head to my blog, entrepreneurs-journey.com, or Google my name, Yaro, Y-A-R-O, and you can find the podcast and everything there. Thanks again, Susie. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and I'll talk to you very soon. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Susie Daphnis. There was so much we could have dived into. I wish I had her available for two to three hours to really talk about all aspects of the different businesses she's run, but hopefully you took away some inspiration, some motivation, and some really great insights into how she's grown and continues to grow her business businesses. Before I round up this episode, I'd just like to remind you to go to interviewsclub.com to sign up for the email list so you get these podcasts as soon as they are released, as well as my very best hand-picked interviews from the EJ Podcast archives. That's available at interviewsclub.com, which will redirect you to my blog, the page specifically, where you can enter your email address to sign up for that email newsletter. I'd also like to encourage you to subscribe to this podcast via iTunes if that is your preferred method and please leave a review. I really would appreciate that if you enjoy the work that I put into this podcast. All right, that's it from me. My name is Yarrow and you've been listening to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. 